Hi there. Thanks so much for joining me for this Adobe Max presentation of the making of Marvel's RTX with Substance 3D and NVIDIA Omniverse. My name is Jacob Norris, and I've worked on things such as the Soul RTX cinematics, which you may have seen for the launch of NVIDIA RTX and ray tracing. I've also done things for Isaac robotics simulations, research and development projects, uh, drive sim, autonomous vehicle training, and of course, the Marbles RTX game and demos that you've seen. If you're interested in checking out more of my work, either now or after the presentation, please feel free to take a look at my social media accounts, which you can find here for any of the handles that you want to check out. Or if you want to get in touch, my email is at the bottom here. Today, we're going to go over the workflow that we used for getting the assets done in time for Marvel's RTX, the team that we had, and previewing some of the assets that were created for the project. Then we'll jump into Adobe Substance 3D Painter. I'm going to walk you through some of the steps for how I created a couple of the assets as well as how others may be using it on the team. And then we'll look at NVIDIA Omniverse. For those of you that don't know what that is, I'll go over a little bit more about what it is, how we used it, and how it may be useful to you and your team as well. So this is the Marvel's RTX project. This is just a small screenshot. And what we wanted to do with the project was really push the boundaries of realism and show off just what these NVIDIA RTX graphics cards are capable of. This is all done in real time. It's actually playable. You can download it on our NVIDIA Omniverse platform. Check out the assets for yourself and take a look at what we had put together for this project. We actually had a pretty short timeline. There was only a two month timeline for the creation of all the assets for this. And of course, for the quality that we wanted to reach, we had to come up with some unique ways of doing this in order to get this done in time. And that also involved a, a bit of new workflows that we had to deal with. So sub D modeling or subdivisional modeling is used oftentimes in films, but for offline rendering and the assets are generally not created in this reverse sort of LOD format that we used where you can render the assets at the lowest sub D and the highest sub D at any time. And they should have the same graphics visualization quality that you're going for. We had to make a huge number of assets for this project. It was over a hundred and each one was meticulously given feedback on and crafted down to the smallest details because we knew we'd see these super close up as well as eventually planning to release them to everyone to check out. Our internal team only consisted of about eight people. And so we knew instantly that we had to start searching for additional artists to help us out on this project. And everyone was using different 3D packages. And this comes into play later with how Omniverse helps tie all these things together and make it easier for you to collaborate on projects like this. The workflow itself really came down to finding each of the artist's strengths. And that also meant both the people on our team and the people that we were hiring for the freelance and the outsourcing positions. We put a couple people on props instantly that we knew we wanted for the project, such as like pencils and paint brushes and small boxes and things that we knew needed to get done before we had any concepts for this project. And as the artists were working on them, we found who was fastest at modeling, who was fastest at UVs, who was fastest at texturing, and of course, who did it the fastest while creating the quality that we were looking for. And so as one artist would finish the model, we pass it on to another artist for UVs. Then the modeler would continue on another asset. The UV artist would finish and start on his next UVs while then passing that asset on to the texture artist. And the texture artist would take it from there and take it to completion. After that was done, it was passed on to myself and my coworker, Artur, who had also assisted in importing all the assets and compiling the scene together. And after all the modelers were done with their assets, they moved on to UVs, then they moved on to texturing, and we utilized each artist all throughout the entire process to really get this thing pushed to completion as fast as we could. It really became like a conveyor belt, but it worked out really well, as you can see. 
Uh, it also involves, of course, some R&D, understanding this new sub D workflow and trying to make it work within this timeline that we had. So we dedicated a single artist on R&Ding that while everyone had started the models. And we kind of had to just spread everybody out and push everyone to their strengths to get this thing working. Dropbox was what we had for this project that really helped us in iterations, version history, and instantly uploading assets as we worked on them. So we had saved our assets and worked on them inside of Dropbox. So as they were done, we don't need to worry about checking in things or people forgetting to check out files and check them in when they're leaving. Dropbox just instantly updated them and they were passed off to the next artist. We reused whatever we could. We repurposed whatever we could if there was batteries just within the scene, we took those same batteries and used them on our mechanisms and mechanical parts, the wiring, we reused textures and had a ton of great smart materials that Adobe Substance 3D helped us with that as a single artist would create maybe a wood or a metal or something we really liked. They'd make a smart material from that. We'd pass it on to another artist who'd apply that to their asset. And it not only helped us keep consistent quality across the project, but kept with that appearance and look of someone working on a small little miniature scene using the same woods and the same plastics and things throughout their set that maybe they purchased from a hardware store. And then Omniverse, of course, helped us to connect everything, as I had mentioned before. So even people that were working in Max, Maya, Blender, Substance, whatever it was they were working in, as they'd finished their asset and we'd import it to Omniverse, then it retains all the information that we're editing and applying to it in Omniverse, like material, material applications, uh, settings, collision, all these gameplay features and animations that we had on this USD file format. And Omniverse uses this USD file format that was created by Pixar, which is Universal Scene Descriptor. And it allows it to be opened within any of these projects and retain all of that information wherever you're opening it on any platform. So we could keep all the animations, we could keep the gameplay information, the collision, all this info on the asset, open it in Max, open it in Maya, Blender, anything we needed to, edit the asset, edit the animations, edit all these different features and aspects of it and re-import it just by using the same file type across the whole project. So it made it super simple to basically work in whatever format we wanted to and still get it all into the same Omniverse collaboration platform. Getting started on the project, it came together super fast. So this is actually something that I had just started concepting on about February 1st. And it was really simple, just blocks and some wood and like plastic slides and things like that. It went from this to a block out of the level that we had in about six days, the exterior, like this, uh, the bookshelves in the background, the windows, everything, uh, of course, was put together by the team. And then a small preview of what we wanted to have for our final level was here in Omniverse at this point, and then sent it off to a concept artist. And as I mentioned, while all this is happening, we already had modelers starting to work on the different props and the different assets that we needed for this. And then as the concept came through, we then took that and started pushing the final quality that we wanted and the additional kind of fun assets like the pencil pushers and the cup shoot and things like that. The reference gathering, we went really in depth with this as far as even going and purchasing some of the products that we were wanting to have in the scene, building them out, uh, sloshing like paint all over them and making sure that what we were creating was exactly how it would look in real life, all the way down to the smallest details of the foil wrapping around batteries, the little concave and dents that you get on those and even having small discussions and arguments about how boxes should be folded depending on their size. If you can have a small box that looks like a full size Amazon box or, or what that would be like, like we went really hardcore making sure this was super legit and as good as we could make it. This is just a couple of the assets that were made for the project. Um, you can check out more of this artwork, as I mentioned on my art station and even see the rest of the team members. I put together a breakdown of the artists that worked on this. If you want to check out who else was able to contribute to this project, this duct tape here, I'm going to go over that in just a moment in substance 3d painter. 
And then this is a, a beautiful vent that I wanted to show off from one of our freelance artists. And you can just see the amazing amount of detail that were put into each one of these assets for the project. This is the full scene we came up with uh, after it was all done. And now let's jump into Substance 3D and take a look. So now we moved into Adobe Substance 3D Painter and I wanted to give you a more in-depth look of how this duct tape was made. I know a lot of you were interested in it when I had first uh, shown it and I did a, a bit of a simple breakdown already on the Adobe Substance website for it. But in this one, we'll go a lot deeper. I'll show you the exact techniques, tools, and tips that I used to create it. So let's start it from scratch. I'm going to hide this folder that I have for it and just create a brand new one. I'm going to call this duct tape and I'm going to create a fill layer just so I can see exactly where that duct tape is being placed. If I go into here and make a mask for it, I'll make a a black mask so that there's nothing selected at the moment and I push F3 it's gonna take me into my UV mode I can use the polygon fill tool and switch it to UV island to really quickly just select all these UV islands for where the duct tape is and you'll notice all the duct tape is laid out horizontally like this that's so when I create that nice thread pattern that's on there it's going to follow all the contours of the duct tape. It's going to go with the folds and it's not going to be deforming or looking strange on the surface. So it's really important I set that up before I created these nice folds and interesting shapes in Marvelous Designer for this tape. Afterwards, I had taken the model into ZBrush and just pulled some of these edges out to get a little bit of that torn look along the sides. The entire time as well, I was following reference for all this. And that really helped me in order to make sure I got the proper look on these torn edges, as well as how the threads actually fit into the duct tape. So I'm really creating from scratch, getting this thread foundation with some of this uh, duct tape surface on top. And we're not going to create the glue because you don't actually see that. But we're going to create as much as we can in 3D to really make it as realistic as possible. I'm going to call this layer that I made base layer. and reduce the height on it quite a bit and you'll see why we're doing that later in just a moment I'm gonna bring up this lightness a bit again to get kind of closer to the color of duct tape and now I'll go ahead and create a fill to get those threads that we have and as as you saw with the reference I'm really just building this directly from scratch in that same sort of thought process if we do a search under the height map here for fabric I'm going to grab this fabric diagonal and use that as sort of like a rope look for the foundation for my threads in here. Now it looks a bit crazy at the moment, but if I add a black mask to this threads and then put a fill on here, what I can do is come into my grayscale and actually use bricks 01 to create the sort of fabric pattern that I'm going for. I had some numbers from the previous duct tape that I used, and I'm just using those again to make this a bit faster, but feel free to take your own artistic liberties with it. At the moment, you'll see they're all kind of tiling diagonally. I want a bit more chaos to it, so I'm just going to adjust the number on the Y and get that looking a bit more interesting like this. And I'll actually throw another fill. Um, we can... We can delete this, actually, and just duplicate this same bricks layer that we have. And I just want to adjust the number on the X to get a bit more vertical pieces. But to get some height variation on those threads, too, I'm going to switch to my height tab at the top and then reduce the blending opacity of that layer a bit. So some of these threads are going to be a bit thicker. Uh, some of them are going to show up more. And then change the normal here, uh, the normal blending mode to linear dodge add and that way they just add on top of each other if I click on the base layer for this I'll come back into my effects and add a levels and I just want to go into the height and kind of even out this thread look a bit more so it doesn't quite look so noisy and I'll just bring up the blacks and bring down the whites so we get some of that thread look on the surface but it doesn't feel as I had mentioned, kind of noisy 
and taking too much attention away. Now going back to the mask, we want to add an anchor for this. And that's because we're going to be using this thread mask in other sections later. So it's already called threads mask. We're going to leave it at that. And if I create another fill layer now, we're going to get that metallic look on the, the duct tape surface. So we'll do tape top. From here, I like to use the iron rough as just a base foundation for what this kind of surface on the tape is going to look like. We're going to increase the roughness quite a bit. This is a bit too glossy for what we saw in our reference on that duct tape. And I'll reduce the brightness of this too. And we can always play with this as we're moving along. We'll want to keep making adjustments the whole time. You'll notice the threads are still showing through on that height map from the layer underneath. So with the height layer select still, I'm just going to change my blend mode now on that tape top to normal. And we'll start adding in some fills here to get the anchor points for this. So now I'll just turn off all these other layers, come into my anchors and add that threads mask that we had there. If you see, there's actually a levels on the anchors. I can adjust the height on that instantly and bring this down until it feels kind of like it's peeking through that upper layer of tape. Something like, Something like that feels pretty good, and we can always continue to adjust it as we go. Now I'll go ahead and add a filter because that, that thread isn't going to be wrapped perfectly by the tape. We want to blur it a bit. The tape won't sit directly on top of every section of that threading. And so if we just slightly blur this, it'll feel a bit more like it's underneath that upper layer of the tape and kind of give it an interesting sort of feel. Let's try like point, point 0.18. That doesn't feel too bad. And then I want to I wanna warp this because if you looked in the reference again, you'll notice those threads, they're kind of wobbly and we get some deformation to them. I don't want that same sort of warped, deformed look. But I'm continuing to turn off all the other layers that I'm filtering because I don't want to be warping the diffuse map or the roughness or any of these other maps that don't need that kind of warp on there. The intensity is good, but it's kind of noisy right now, so I'm going to reduce the tiling, the tiling amount on what's using the mask for warping. If I bring this down to point, point 0.4, you'll notice it's not quite as noisy, and we get larger warping patterns by adjusting that tiling amount. And that already feels quite a bit better. We're getting, we're getting pretty close to what we want for this tape really fast. Now, if I add another fill layer onto here, what I want to get is a bit more dirt and such. So we'll get some dirt on this surface. And what I often tend to do for the dirt is I'll add, I'll add like a, a concrete material for my foundation. And I'll just turn the height off and you can adjust like the base color and information for that with just the levels. I'll throw levels onto here and kind of darken, darken it up a bit. Maybe increase the contrast, and you can play with that. Dirt. We'll throw on a black mask and just use the default dirt generator. I can oftentimes get a pretty good mask just from that default dirt generator, and you can always adjust it with edge wear or custom painting or whatever you want from there but we do need to play with the levels a bit. If we change our material mode to view the, the mask of what this dirt looks like, we can see exactly where that's being placed on here. Something like that feels nice. Maybe increase the contrast slightly and add some grunge to it. Let's go back into our material mode. It's kind of subtle at the moment, but that's okay. We just wanted some, some surface information from it. Now, those edges of the tape where it's torn, it can be really cool to get some of those threads to show through and feeling like the tape on top is actually tearing away from where the threads are. So if we take that tape top, which is this metal surface here, and add a white mask, we can really quickly mask out very specifically those edges by using the UV border on this. I mean, you could go through and custom paint everything, 
But just by adding this generator, coming to here, and I've recently been using this one a lot more lately. I found it can be super fun and gives me some great results for a lot of things I do. Coming into the mask mode, you can see uh, if I switch to both my 3D and 2D view, it's masking most all these edges for the UV borders. And we'll just tighten that up so it's right along those tips of the tape and add some contrast in there so it's a nice sharp tear along the edge. Maybe reduce slightly more. And then just to get a bit more variation on that edge, I'm gonna add another filter here. And it's already got warp selected. I love that warp, I'm always coming through and adjusting the tiling and kind of doing multiple warps sometimes on the same masks in different ways. That's feeling pretty nice. Let's see what it looks like. It looks like perhaps I still need to adjust a couple of the settings. Let me see. Coming into the dirt top, I think the mask is backwards. I need to go back into that UV border and invert it. There we go. And now it clips right along the edge there like that. That's a pretty good foundation to work with. Perhaps that bevel's a bit strong, but you'll remember that base layer I created, I turned the height down way to a negative one, and that's what's giving us this nice uh, bordered bevel right here. If I just increase that height on that base layer, it'll start evening out that bevel and starting to make it feel a bit less, less strong, a bit more realistic. Something along there feels pretty nice. And then one of the last things I want to add is just some simple edge wear on here. If I do another fill layer, and when I do edge wear at first, I tend to often just leave all the default settings for a brand new layer. It, it gives me pretty good results most of the time because you want this kind of light, light color and light look to where the scratches and surface edge wear are coming from. So let's do a mask again. I'm bringing this edge wear mask onto here and going to reduce this a lot. Oh, <laughs> you know what? I didn't make a mask yet. I was wondering why everything just turned black all of a sudden. So I need to go into a black mask, add the generator, and now we got the metal edge wear. This is a pretty standard technique to use this edge wear. Uh, oftentimes I'll just play with all the settings, get the curvature looking right. And as I mentioned, kind of taking your own artistic liberties to get this looking exactly where you want it. If I increase this grunge amount a bit, I like to get some more variation on there besides just having the edges. So I tend to increase the grunge and decrease the curvature weight. So you also so often get these perfectly sharp edges that go right along where your curvature is. If we add another warp onto here, just like that, it gets a bit more variation just on those edges really quickly and really nicely. That's almost pretty much exactly what we want. Like you can continue to play with the settings from there, but that's a really strong foundation for a great tape. If we turn this layer off, and go back to our original, you can see it looks pretty similar. So hopefully there were some interesting new techniques in this. There's some cool ways to create the artwork you want. And now you can go out there and make your own awesome duct tape whenever you want. This is NVIDIA Omniverse. This is actually the program that we use to bring together all of the artwork that was created for Marvel's RTX and what we ultimately use to play the game in. And as you can see, uh, it's all running in real time. And I'm actually on an NVIDIA Studio laptop. So this laptop has an RTX enabled graphics card, but even with just the power of a laptop and RTX, I'm able to open up the full Marvel scene. And as you can see, we can go all the way up to each one of these assets 
and all of them have these incredibly high resolution 4K and 2K texture sets to get the fidelity from all of our assets in this project. The Omniverse launcher is available on our website and you can go up to the help option once you open it here to check out our reference guide and all the Omni UI documents in case you're interested in understanding a bit more how to use it or looking at some of the tutorials that were created for this. So the other thing to mention uh, that maybe not everyone knows as well is the entire demo in terms of the poly count that this is rendered at came out to around 100 million polygons and we had over 100 unique assets all created with the sub D modeling workflow that I had mentioned before. You see, you can zoom in incredibly close on all these assets. And these are all actual polygons, not alphas that are being rendered here in real time. It's really easy. Also, if you're looking to use this, not necessarily for collaboration as a team, for things such as uh, drive simulation, robotics simulation, physics simulation, uh, many other options, including like as we created here, a game. Um, but you can even just use this for rendering your artwork as an artist. And this is currently in real-time RTX mode. But if I switch this to path traced mode, you'll see you can actually render this in a path tracer similar to iRay or many of the other programs out there available that you render in path trace. Uh, let me give you just a super quick demo here. If I come into this camera that I created and I'll drag and drop this battery asset that I have here. If I come over here to the layers option and toggle on my live sync mode here, I'm currently connected to our Omniverse server. And if you're on a team, you can connect to any server that you would set up yourself as well. This is another instance of Omniverse running. Imagine this would be running on another machine, on another computer anywhere in the world. So this would be a single user in say the United States, and then you'd have a user here in the UK and Europe or somewhere in Asia. And because I have this live mode enabled, if I just grab any part of this asset and move it around, you'll see it actually updates in real time in this other scene here as well. And this applies to modeling, to texturing, to whatever I want. The Omniverse actually connects to Maya, Blender, Max, all these other programs and can all be updated in real time using this USD file format, the Universal Scene Descriptor. And that allows you to have all of the data sets and information carried over between these programs because of this USD file format. I definitely suggest you Grab Omniverse, take a look at it, and check it out when you get the chance. Thanks so much for following along with this Adobe Max presentation, and I hope it was useful and interesting for a lot of you. I'll see you next time.